Aloha and good morning. Thank you so much for joining us here on the platforms of the Honolulu Star Advertiser. I'm Yanji Denise, joined by Ryan Kalei Suji, and this is Spotlight Hawaii. We know there are some big events happening right now in Washington, but we are focusing today on uh, the legislative body right here at home. The session begins on January 20th, and Ryan, uh, legislators have a lot facing them right here at home. That's right, just a few weeks away from the start of yet another legislative session. And there are a number of issues that will be in front of lawmakers this coming session, including, of course, the state's response to COVID-19, as well as a variety of other issues like the state budget. And joining us this morning from the state capitol, we have House Speaker Scott Psyche, who is joining us, as well as Majority Leader Della Al-Baladi. Good morning to both of you. Thanks so much for joining us. Good morning. Thanks for inviting us today. Thank you. We want to we want to first start off uh, with the budget. We'll start off there. Obviously, uh, you know, there have been members in both the House and the Senate who have spoken out against Governor Ige's proposal for these state furloughs, which we now, of course, include teachers within those state positions. Uh, but however, because of this latest act of CARES Act funding, we now know that those talks of furloughs have been put on hold to the middle uh, of the year at least. Uh, but some ec economic experts that we've spoken to on this program say that CARES Act funding is like putting a Band-Aid on a much larger wound that is going to be the state budget. Uh, so my first question, we'll start off with you, Speaker. With many in opposition of the governor's furloughs, uh, what else option, what other options, I guess, are on the table in terms of filling the void uh, in the budget? And are you looking to introduce uh, any other measures that might help to stimulate economic growth for the state during this time? Yeah, so kind of the, you know, the short term and the long term plan is for us to try to get through the next couple of years as far as the state budget goes. Um, we know that we have that we'll have to make some hard decisions over the next two years, but we really want to um, try to mitigate the impact of budget cuts because we, you know, state legislators receive um, a lot of feedback from their constituents whenever government, whenever cuts are made um, in the schools or in healthcare programs or in other areas. So we hear directly from our constituents um, and they are not always happy with with the budget cuts that, that come down. So we we want to shore up the budget over the next couple of years. I think we can start off by, you know, taking a look at um, some of the administrative measures, some administrative measures such as um, not filling vacant positions, um, consolidating positions, I'm doing some administrative things to, to save to save money. You know, when you start to do that, it it adds up after after a while. Um, but there the, the budget will definitely be a work in progress this year. It will, t it will take us four months to, to slog through it, um, you know, with the influx of new federal funds. And I think with the change, you know, with, with the Georgia election and with the change in Congress, we hopefully will see more, more federal funds um, coming down over the next few months. If I could jump in, though, and, and also say that this is an opportunity to rethink and reimagine government so that there's also conversations about how we do restructure government. I think this is a really good opportunity. Uh, we've learned so much during the pandemic about things like telework, uh, teledistance learning. And so are there opportunities where we might realize long term savings? And this goes to more of the long term um, thinking that we can do as a legislature, in addition to what speaker said. Let's talk about some first steps. I know that one of the things there had even been talk about calling a special session to bring you folks back to change the mask mandate penalty. Um, of course, we've talked about the mask mandate a lot on this show. The governor has uh, reiterated every time he's on that there is a statewide mask mandate, but it does carry a misdemeanor penalty. And our understanding is that that's largely not being carried out. The citations might be issued, but uh, the vast majority of those citations have been dismissed. Do you think that there is momentum to get it passed so that there would be a fine attached to that, something that the governor can't do, uh, but that the legislature could do? And, and if so, how fast could that actually come to pass? Mr. Speaker, we'll start with you. Yeah, there will, there will definitely be legislation to take up the, um, the enforcement issue. Um, I think that the, um, the, um, that the, the misdemeanor, um, um, of the misdemeanor offense is, is too harsh for, for the mask mandate. Uh, we need to, um, I think we need to look at uh, converting it into basically a, something that can be ticketed where somebody receives a ticket or a violation for, um, for, the, mask, for the mask offense. Um, as far as the statewide mask order, um, there might be a need for the legislature to clarify that as well in statute. Um, and currently the governor has issued a proclamation to impose, to impose the mask order. 
um, but there might be there might be a need to to provide more clarity and who that applies to and and how it applies. You know, I want to go back, if we can, just to talk a little bit more about the budget. Uh, and, and Representative Bilotti, uh, we'll start off with you with this. Uh, you know, you mentioned about diversification. Uh, but, you know, when you look at just the simple like, economics of things, right? If, if the state is spending more than it's bringing in, obviously, we will be operating at a deficit. And th that is worrisome just for the long term picture. And with projections for overall tourism numbers continuing to take a while to get back to normal, as well as tax overall tax revenue, uh, there, there could be some serious issues ahead of the state in terms of the budget uh, shortfalls. Is there any specific measures that the state is looking for that maybe the majority part uh, packet will be included in the majority package to help to stimulate this? You know, we've heard talks in the past about raising the GET. What is that on the table? Uh, legalizing some form of gambling. Is there any other, I guess, mechanism that could help to increase overall uh, expense, uh, overall exp um, budget support during this time? So you you kind of described the situation perfectly, Ryan. There, the 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 hurt that we're going through as a state is is so extreme, and really, our, our tax revenues are not coming in in the way that they've had in the past. I think what's great about the legislative session is that all all ideas are on the table, but I think you will also quickly see that some will not uh, rise to the level of, of of really serious discussion. You know, I think. One thing that we caution is that any kind of immediate tax revenue generation proposals, we know it actually takes a, quite a long time to, to realize uh, the, those um, tax revenues. So I think the kinds of things that we're gonna be looking at are some of the things that uh, speakers spoke about, looking at special funds, looking at um, some of the proposals, you know, the governor did task the agencies uh, with proposals to, to see where they could make uh, smart cuts. We're going to look at that. Um, but I also think that there will be discussions about different um, uh, taxes. Um, but again, it's 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 a process. Can I, well, and can I just add something really quickly that, you know, um, we we do not want to tax our way ourselves out of this um, situation. And we know that the public does not want to be overtaxed. And, you know, and if we have to impose taxes, I think we're going to have to show the public how those funds are gonna be used effectively to benefit them. So we do not wanna over uh, tax ourselves out of this situation. Let's talk a little bit about the recent announcement from the Department of Hawaiian Homelands uh, saying that they're proposing a casino in Kapolei. I'd love to get both of your takes on uh, the project and where you stand on that. Uh, there, we did have uh, Tyler Gomes on here, deputy chair on Monday, and he said that he does have some support of lawmakers who are ready to introduce this bill. Uh, where do each of you stand on that? Representative Bilotti, we'll start with you. Sure, I think that's a perfect example of kind of um, similar controversial ideas that have been raised in the past before. And for me, I've always opposed um, large scale gambling in that manner. I don't think that that's something that the community necessarily supports. It was very interesting to see that even the Hawaiian community was divided. So again, I think, um, is this a situation where there will be more conversation around it? Will there be legislative members who support it? Sure, but I personally uh, don't think that there is the support for that proposal uh, in, in the legislative process. Mr. Speaker, what are your thoughts? So this is definitely um, a proposal that the legislature needs to hear and, and consider. Um, we should not dismiss it outright. Um, I give a lot of credit to the Department of Hawaiian Homelands leadership for bringing this forward. So the, Depart the Department of Hawaiian Homelands has not really done this before. So I give them a lot of credit for doing that. Um, I, I expect that there, we will hear a lot from the beneficiaries of Hawaiian Homelands on, on this proposal. But it's something that we need we need to just sit back and, and listen uh, to the people. You know, one of the things right now that is top of mind, of course, with regard to the pandemic is the safe travels program that the state has set up. Uh, Speaker, you've spoken in the past about wanting some sort of unified ruling for the entire state rather than having each county be allowed to sort of make their decisions on what is best for their counties. We, we've heard from the mayors on this program saying that they want more authority to be able to adjust the rules as needed for each of their own communities. What are your thoughts going into this legislative session about looking at any sort of uh, legislative uh, material or any legislative matters that might help to address the overall safe travels program and where we're at right now? Yeah, so I mean, I'll give you some breaking news because I'm considering um, introducing legislation to create a statewide safe travels um, program. 
um, that would apply to all of the counties. You know, I get it. I get it that each mayor is totally concerned about the health and safety of the residents on their islands. But, uh, you know, our economy is a statewide economy and travel and tourism is a big component of that statewide economy. So when you have one county that tr that basically changes the rules for itself, it disrupts the entire statewide system. And I think that we're at a point now where uh, we need to, really need to take a look at whether or not uh, counties should be able to create exemptions for themselves or whether we should have a statewide system in place that, that we know works and that does protect public health and safety. Well, what, what would be different? What would be different about something that you would pass versus what's in effect right now? What don't you like about the current program? Is it just that there are different uh, rules for different counties or is there something specific that you don't like? Right, so there are different rules for, for different counties at this point. Um, the fact that a county could opt out of the Safe Travels program, I think, posed a, a problem for all of us. Um, there needs to be a consistent statewide standard in place. You know, for one thing, um, I think it also creates confusion for, for travelers, for out-of-state travelers. They don't know what the rules are in Hawaii, and which, which may make them travel elsewhere. So we just need to have consistency and um, a, 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 clear, a clear read of what the rules are for Hawaii travel. And I would echo that it's not just outside travelers. This causes a lot of confusion for residents. So I think a, a statewide policy makes a lot of sense. Um, and then, you know, there are statewide resources going to all the islands to ensure health and safety. So I think that's kind of part of the, the social bargain, the social contract that we have as a state. And so we can I also add that, you know, the, the data so far, or at least the data that we've seen from the health department tells us that COVID spread is not occurring from travelers. That spread, it's community spread that causes the cases in Hawaii. It's not travel. And if anything, I think if you break it down further, the travel related cases are probably more likely to come from Hawaii residents who are traveling to places like Las Vegas and then return home with COVID. And so with the legislation that you would propose for this statewide safe travelers program, would that also include flexibility on when people are tested uh, the second testing. I mean, how detailed would that overall ruling be? Because we know that the governor at times has had to change that based on, uh, you know, influx in cases on the mainland and the way things are going. And he has sort of that authority. Of course, the legislative process, you know, takes a little bit longer because of the mechanics that it has to go through through the legislature. So what would that sort of mass of that statewide pro uh, protocol look like? So the pre the pretest, it would basically be uh, putting into place um, through statute, what is currently in place through the governor's proclamation, which, that, which is that there is a 72 hour pretest requirement for individuals who arrive in Hawaii for, and who for some reason have not received their test result yet, then there will be an opportunity for them to be tested here. There would not, there would not be a requirement for a second test. I think the county mayors would push back against this, obviously saying that they want autonomy over their, their own islands and also for their communities. And also just that the legislature, uh, as Ryan pointed out, is not nearly as nimble. Um, just, you know, the, the, the governor can issue through emergency proclamation, something that can yeah. basically be enacted right away. So um, given that there are so many variables in the pandemic and things change so rapidly, are you at all concerned that by doing something like this, we could create laws that work for now, but not might not work, uh, you know, down the road if we discover a new variant or if there's some kind of change in CDC protocol. How do you how do you guard against that? Well, that's why the you know the legislature does have the flexibility to um, to reconvene if there are changes that need to be made. There is there is some flexibility at the, at the legislative level. Okay, we'll definitely keep an eye out for that. I want to switch gears here. Another topic and a bill that was. Uh, made headlines, of course, was that concerning Aloha Stadium. We know that plans were moving forward during the last, leg last legislative session. Uh, things sort of fell apart due to language issues with the bill. Where are we at now with uh, the Aloha Stadium, its current state? We know that, of course, uh, that they have sort of put uh, uh, closed down any sort of games or any sort of operation that's happening at the stadium. And so there is sort of this expedited wish to kind of get things rolling. Uh, Representative Bellotti, do you know of any sort of plans of where we're at with that bill? And do you see that as something being passed through fairly quickly so the project can get rolling? 
Well, my understanding, and I'm going to also look to speaker to confirm this, is that the process for the new stadium is still moving along. And so we have to let that process roll out. Uh, with respect to the Aloha Stadium, making the decision it made, I mean, looking at the trajectory of vaccines coming out at at sports, really not fully opening up. It actually made a lot of sense to me that they made the decision, the hard decision that they needed to do. Um, but I think, you know, we are moving quickly with a new stadium. So I would, uh, again, defer to speaker or maybe like even check in with um, uh, the area legislators. I know that uh, Senator Wakai and Rep Johansson have been following that and that has been moving along to my knowledge. Yeah, so there are a couple of issues that still have to re be resolved. One is, the governance issue, who's in charge of this project, what state agency is in charge of this project. And then the second issue, the second question is, uh, what is the real cost of this project um, over the long term? It started off at uh, $350 million on the state side, but is it is that the real cost of the project? I think we, we need to determine what the actual cost will be um, before we make uh, more decisions on this. I'd, I'd like to get both of your thoughts on the vaccine rollout. Yesterday, yesterday we saw a press conference with uh, the governor, the lieutenant governor, and the state health director talking about the timetable for vaccine rollout and the idea of creating some centers to help to administer this vaccines, particularly for communities that might not have a community, uh, you know, primary care provider. Um, you know, what are your thoughts just on how it's going so far? And, and do you think that we can meet the needs of the community when it comes to rolling out this vaccine, particularly with communities that don't have direct access to health care? I'll take that. I think, you know, the rollout of the vaccines, I know people are anxious and they want to get their vaccines. We also contend with the, um, the uh, population group that may not want to get their vaccines and are kind of hesitant. I think that the Department of Health has been proceeding very steadily. Um, I personally know a lot of frontline workers who are already starting to roll and get their second shots. And I think the approach that we are taking is, is, is smart and steady. Um, a lot of it is being determined by um, the vaccines being allotted to us as a state. Um, I think it's really important that we've made outreach to um, various um, health centers so and, and um, people have already been deployed to um, care homes. So I think what we're seeing is a steady rollout of the vaccines. And I, I'm hopeful um, as the governor and Lieutenant Governor and Dr. Char announced that by January 18th, we're gonna see even more vaccines being administered. I know that the Department of Health, um, Eddie Mercero's teams are, are creating pods. There have been two pods uh, on this island, I believe that have reached out and, and administered over thousands of vaccines already. So it's happening at a steady pace. And I think the request is, is that we all kind of be patient. Switching gears here, you know, one of the areas that catches a lot of people's attention during this legislative session, especially for nonprofit organizations, is the grant and aid portion of the state budget. And in just recognizing the condition that the state is in uh, due to COVID-19 and a lot of these nonprofits struggling, uh, these projects that rely on GIAs, to continue the work that they do. Uh, are you expecting sort of an increase in the overall demand for GIA support during this time? And is there maybe something that the finance leadership is looking at to maybe increase sort of support for GIAs? Because we know year in and year out, this is already, you know, always a competitive sort of thing to try to get that GIA funding. And especially now going into this session, it'll likely be more. What are your thoughts on providing maybe more support for those that re rely on GIA funding? Yeah, so this is um, this is this is a hard a hard topic, and this um, Senate President uh, Kochi and I, you know, spent a few weeks discussing this topic because we weren't sure if we were going to have funds available for for grant and aids. And just you know, just to, for background, what happens every year is when the legislature is finalizing the state budget, when we see that there might be some funds available, then we set them aside for for grants for nonprofits who, who have submitted applications. Uh, but this year, given the shortfall, um, the Senate president and I decided that we would not um, accept applications for, for grants. And we, for one thing, we didn't want to create a false impression or false expectations uh, for nonprofits um, who may be expecting grants this year. We wanted to be very clear and upfront about it at the prior to the start of the session. Um, 
but we will, you know, hopefully we can see if there's a way that uh, nonprofits could seek some of the CARES funds that were allocated to the state um, in in uh, in May. There there was uh, there were some funds made available for sp for specific program areas such as uh, housing, food, even things like domestic violence. So there may be opportunities at the federal level, and you know we want to be helpful in in trying to um, link up the nonprofits with those funds. Just to get some clarity there, are you saying that no, there, there will be no grants at all this year in the budget? There will be no grants through our grant and aid program, which is the legislative grant and aid program. There, there would, there, that, so that's separate from, that's separate from, from funding for, um, for nonprofits that is made available through regular, um, our regular operating, but operating budget. So just to build upon that, you know, within our regular operating budget, uh, many social services are actually contracted with nonprofit agencies. And so those are the things that we are trying to help hopefully shore up. But again, even those are going to be under scrutiny because of the um, economic downturn we are in. Um, and I think, you know, what one of the things that we did see during the pandemic was the partnerships that happened to make sure that we got services out to communities. So, so the focus is going to be trying to shore up those things that are really, really critically important um, to the foundation of our communities. And this is just my inexperience with the ledge. Ryan is the expert on this here, but um, typically, Mr. Speaker, how, how big is that grant and aid budget? I mean, how much money are we talking about that, that these, uh, these agencies or these nonprofits can no longer apply for? Yes. Yeah, so in the prior years, it was um, fifteen one five million dollars a year, fifteen million a year, and it was split between the House and the Senate. So, so yeah. So the grant and aid program that we're discussing is the legislative grant and aid program, which is basically discretionary grants that the legislature can award directly to nonprofits who apply for funds. I mean, that just seems like a very significant change and, and, and we're looking at so many nonprofits falling on some pretty tough times. What have you heard uh, from those folks now that you've made that announcement? I haven't received a lot of comments yet. Uh, I think we sent out our notice on, um, on Monday. Um, but I, I, you know, I, I think that the nonprofits were pretty much aware um, that we were not going to provide the discretionary grants this year. Want to switch gears here and talk a little bit about the tourism industry. Obviously, it has been a huge part of the economic driver for the state for some time, and we're just seeing slowly seeing visitors trickle in. Are you at all worried about the numbers that we're seeing? You know, we talked to some hospitality officials who are pretty concerned at this point in time, uh, just with their overall operating expenses and what they're having to produce on their end and what they're receiving from incoming visitors. Uh, many saying that they're not sure how long they can continue to operate at this level. Uh, is there any sort of support that the legislature is looking to provide hospitality, has, the hospitality industry during this time? Uh, we'll start with you, Representative Baladi. I would just um, cite back to trying to have consistent policies to ensure that we can have a pipeline of the tourists that we want here. You know, uh, this speaks to us really developing policies for managed tourism. And I think the more consistent our policies are, the more that people understand what they need to do, um, then we will see a larger uh, uh, influx of tourists that we do need. And I think it's critically um, uh, important to look at the example of Kauai. When they did opt out, their small businesses are incredibly um, uh, vulnerable now. And so, to the degree that we can have more consistency, that's gonna be what's gonna be driving um, hopefully more numbers to the state. And we, and we also have to ensure that the, um, the state's public health program is in place, right? That's, that's um, testing, um, screening, testing, contact tracing, and then quarantine if necessary. That's, you know, that's just, that's a, that's a fundamental um, responsibility of the state government, not just uh, to protect Hawaii residents, but also to protect um, travelers. So we have to make sure that that component is in place. Can I jump in here? Because this is sort of breaking news for, um, for the day. Department of Health is um, uh, launching the Aloha Safe app, a contact tracing program um, for the um, island of Oahu. So it is now a statewide app. And that uh, speaks to um, Mr. Speaker's comment about us continuing to be, be vigilant about contact tracing, 
um, testing, uh, quarantining, and isolating. The, um, we're, we're asking all people in the state to download the Aloha Safe app if they can, because that will go uh, very far in helping us contact trace um, if, the, if the virus continues to spread. Yeah, yes, and the sir. other component is the one that you mentioned, Ryan, which is vaccinations. We have to make sure that we have a solid vaccination um, rollout in our state. Uh, and I'd like to get both of your thoughts. I know it's a, a different sort of a authoritative body, of course, but uh, we have a new mayor joining us, uh, Mayor Rick Langiardi, of, of course, taking the helm over the weekend. And I'd like to get both of your thoughts on the tier system that Oahu has currently in place. What are, you, what are your thoughts? Should that continue? Would you envision, you know, if you're talking about sort of blanket the uh, safe travels program, would you support blanketing a tier system for the entire state as well? Mr. Speaker, let's start with you. I, the tier system, I think, works for, for Oahu. I mean, we have 80% um, of the population here, so I think that there should be a specific program for Oahu. I think that um, it seems that the the, tier, the current system is is going pretty well. I I'm glad that the that inmates were exempted from the from that calculation. Um, there may be a couple of areas that could be, uh, you know, loose given more flexibility. But for the most part, I think it's good to have that seven day tier system in place. Okay, Representative Bilotti, what are your thoughts on that? I think the tier system is a good way that the counties have that control and they are so much more closer to what's happening on the ground that it does make sense that maybe counties have different tier systems. But I think within each county, um, like like speaker said, you know, it's kind of really paying attention to the data and then giving the flexibility um, if we understand where truly the transmission is happening, what businesses can open or not open. I think as a nod to the small business community, there has been tremendous, tremendous effort to really make small businesses operate safely. So I think to where the where, where flexibility can be given, that would be, be helpful to also help us restart our economy. You don't want to ask as we sort of head into the home stretch of our conversation here. And as you look to this ne next legislative session, uh, your overall thoughts about working with the administration and with the governor. We know that early on in this pandemic, there was a lot of disagreement between leaders in the legislative body as well as in the administration and on the county level. Uh, we're seeing what's happening today, specifically nationally, with just uh, the disagreements that happened between these various bodies of government. Uh, wanted to get your thoughts on, on how you feel going into this uh, legislative session. We know that it is a critical time. If you can speak to a start off with you, Speaker, your working relationship with the administration, and if you are confident that you guys will be able to accomplish some of these things, knowing that you guys are on different pages when it comes to some of these policies. Yeah, so the, the House has um, always um, tried to work very closely with the governor and to be very, uh, we've tried to be very supportive of one another. Um, we agree to disagree. Um, and, um, but, you know, there are a lot of, most of the time we, we tend to agree with, with the governor. And so, I think that it'll be. Um, um, I think it'll be a productive session. We know that we have to um, get over any kind of personal differences and and things like that. We have to be, be very functional this year. And uh, Representative Bilotti? You know, I think there's always natural tensions between the three branches of government, and that's healthy. Um, but I do believe that all of our government leaders at the end of the day are really looking out for the benefit of the people and how we move this community forward together. Uh, and, it's, and so I think while, while it's going to be healthy, we're going to have healthy discussions. I do think that we're going to be at the end of the day working together with this administration. Our conversation is almost over, but I do want to um, bring in one of the concerns that we've heard is just the practicalities of people being able to comment through the session. Um, you know, one of the things that is that is surprised in Hawaii's uh, lawmaking system is that people do get to come in and have their voices heard and speak to committees directly. How are you managing that? And what is the mechanism for people to actually participate in this session? Uh, not the lawmakers per se, but just average citizens. Mr. Speaker, how, how are you accommodating people in that way? Yes, yeah, so we we spent the um, entire summer um, at the legislature working to build up our um, IT infrastructure uh, because we anticipated that we would have to conduct virtual public hearings um, once the session begins, which is what we will be doing. So the public hearings will be held virtually. We will be giving, um, um, providing information to the public for those who wish to participate at the hearings. They will be given um, links to register. 
They can submit testimony. They can testify uh, 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 via Zoom. Hearings will also be live streamed for those who just want to observe public hearings. Um, we know that it, you know, it. We know that there's no substitute for people being here in person, and that was something that we just agonized over. But for health and safety reasons, for the for the members, for the staff, and for the general public, we felt that we had to go with uh, virtual hearings this year. And I would just add that's this is the kind of the silver lining in the pandemic. I think we have all learned as a community how to um, interact virtually, and so I'm hopeful that with all the work that especially our house um, tech staff and our house sergeant at arms and our house clerk's office as well as the senate have put into really thinking through this process that we may actually see um, even greater participation um, you know we've long wanted to have more participation from neighbor islands so this is going to be one way that we in fact do have a more reach uh, for, further into the community well, there's no doubt that there, this will be a very busy legislative session for all of you. Uh, and so we thank you very much for taking the time this morning to join us uh, and sort of give us an update on what's to come this session. House Speaker Scott Psyche, Majority Leader, Representative Dada Abdullahi, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thanks for inviting us. Thank Aloha. you. Thank you. Well, Ryan, well, we definitely broke some news this morning with uh, the speaker saying that they, they want to change the Safe Travels program, make it the purview of the legislature, make, you know, have a statewide policy as opposed to the counties kind of each doing their own thing under emergency proclamation for the gov from the governor. I think there will be quite a bit of pushback from county leaders on that. So that'll be an interesting thing to watch. Yeah, and we've heard on this program from those mayors that we've spoken to who have specifically asked for more authority in their own uh, areas to be able to make the decisions that impact their community. And so this would sort of be going against that by providing an overarching uh, roadmap, if you will, to the Safe Travels program, allowing everybody to fall under that same umbrella. And so we'll see how that unfolds. So again, we'll be speaking with Governor Ige on Friday, so we'll likely get his thoughts on that. Uh, and also just hearing about the grant and aid program and knowing that that is uh, not going to be available to many nonprofits and organizations and projects that rely on that funding. But, uh, you know, the speaker said that they're hoping that the CARES Act funding will also help to support some of those areas and those those nonprofits that rely on state support. Yeah, the speaker saying he sent the letter out on Monday notifying the nonprofits who, um, as he noted, are, are probably were expecting that kind of news, but still $15 million off the table for Hawaii nonprofits is a pretty major change, uh, belt tightening all across the board. So um, there's there's really nobody who is immune from this. That's right. And, and we'll get the governor's take on all of these issues, as well as uh, the comments that uh, both Representative Bellotti and Speaker Saigi have talked about. We'll be speaking to him about, of course, the impact of COVID-19, uh, the CARES Act funding and where things are at now as we get more information about what specifically was included in that bill and how the state plans to use this next surge of influx in, uh, rev uh, in, influx in cash to sort of help the state budget and overall operating expenses again. So that will be happening on Friday at 1030. And then we have a lot to look forward to next week as well. That's right. Uh, coming up next week, we're going to have Lieutenant Governor Josh Green on Monday. We're going to be asking him specifically about the vaccine rollout program. Uh, I know that a lot of you have questions about when can I get my shot and who's who qualifies when and, and the timetables. He laid some of that out yesterday, but we'll be diving deep on that with him. Uh, Congressman Ed Case is going to be joining us on Wednesday. It'll be very interesting to get an update from Washington from him. And then on Friday, uh, Anne Pereira Estaclio from the Department of Labor and Industrial Relations will be coming on to answer all of your unemployment questions. Now that we do have the second CARES Act, what does that mean for benefits? We're gonna be taking, taking a dive on that with her. That's right, so a lot to look forward to. We thank you all for tuning in here to Spotlight Hawaii and uh, we look forward to seeing you right back here on Friday at 10.30. Aloha. Aloha. <laughs>